I played basketball back in sixth, seventh grade. Okay. I was okay at dribbling. I was okay at passing. I was even okay at defending. I'm terrible at shooting. Even when I'm just standing at the free throw line, I only make about 40% of my free throws, which is terrible if you want to be a basketball player. You got to make at least 60%, ideally 70 or 80% of your free throws. So I'm about a 40% free throw shooter. I've done experiments. And yes, that's bad. So I'm thinking about me shooting free throws. Dr. Kinney, Dr. K shooting free throws. And nobody else is even in the gym, right? There, there's no pressure on me except myself to make these free throws. But still, my probability of success, P, on any given attempt, attempt is 0.4. Okay, now maybe you're not that good even, but basketball players should be better. So it's good I'm not a basketball player. Of course, I could maybe get better with practice, but I'm interested in various kinds of quantities. Maybe I should even give these quantities different names. I could have, I could say let X, these are random variables, so they're gonna be capital letters. Let X equal, my number of successes, which would be I make the free throw, in say 10 attempts, in 10 trials is the more general word to use. Number of successes, making the free throw in 10 attempts, 10 trials, that would be something of interest. And by the way, when I talk about these things, before I talk about the probability mass function, the mean, the variance, and that kind of stuff, moment generating function, um, you should think about what would be most likely for X. Uh, I hope it's pretty clear that most likely, out of all the possibilities, X is going to be four, right? Four out of 10 is what I'd make. Now, will it be four? Not necessarily. There's a pretty decent chance I make, make three out of 10 or even five out of 10 little smaller chance of making two out of 10 or six out of 10, really small chance of making one out of 10 or seven out of 10, and very, very small chances of missing all 10 or making, say, eight or more. I hope that right off the bat seems pretty intuitive. Let's consider some other random variables. I could also let, say, y be the number of trials, attempts, until I make a certain number of free throws. Until I make, how many free throws? Oh, I don't know. Say I'm trying to punish myself. Until I make 10 free throws. I could have made it 20 free throws or, or something. Until I, or, uh, until I have 10 successes, let's phrase it that way. <clears throat> oh, I'm running low on letters here. Let Z be the number of failures until I have 10 successes. And yeah, I, I, I should have started with it, not something other than X. Uh, let's let W be probably the weirdest random variable of all. The number of successes in a certain amount of time. Um, number of successes. You know, I think I don't want to use W. Uh, U? Okay, U. Number of successes in, oh, I don't know, how about two minutes? Now, there's something else going on with you, of course. I got to go get the ball. And how fast do I run and go get the ball? Or maybe somebody passes it back to me to try to be as efficient as possible. Okay, just for the sake of keeping things simple, assume at every attempt, somebody catches it and passes back to me right away. So I, I'm shooting these things as fast as possible. It is a different kind of random variable though, because you're 
it's not a certain number of, uh, not a clear number of attempts. So you might say there, there's a boundary in how many attempts I can do in two minutes. Four random variables. I'm interested in knowing their distributions. Their pro when I say that, when I say I want to know the distribution of the random variable, what do I mean? I mean, I want to know, first of all, the probability mass function, PMF, PDF in the book. And if I know the probability mass function, then I can figure out other things. I can figure out the mean. I can figure out the variance, the standard deviation. I could figure out the CDF, cumulative distribution function. I could figure out probabilities. I could figure out all those things. That's what it means to find or know the distribution. X, number of successes in a certain number of trials, and the number of trials is called N, is called a binomial random variable or a binomial distribution. X itself would be a binomial random variable. You would say X has, has a binomial distribution. Y and Z, if you think about it, are really related to each other, aren't they? Like it takes me, you know, what's the most likely number of trials until I have 10 successes? If my probability of success each time I try it is 0. 0.4, probably 25 since 10 is 40% of 25. Probably Y is gonna be 25 or close to 25 which means Z would be close to 15, right? 15 plus 10 is 25. So Y and Z seem like they're related. And in fact, yes, they are related enough that they both are said to have a negative binomial distribution. Though, negative binomial distribution though they are they don't have the exact same distribution because they are technically different random variables they're just related to each other and they're the relationship is so tight they both are called negative binomial why turns out to be the way that our book talks about negative binomial our textbook z turns out to be the way that other textbooks and Wikipedia, for example, talk about it. This is our text, other texts. Now I'm not talking about their names, Y and Z. I'm just talking about the idea, either number of trials until a certain number of successes or number of failures until a certain number of successes. In both cases, the 10 here, the number of successes is labeled with letter R. and U is the number of successes in two minutes, that's said to have a Poisson distribution, P-O-I-S-S-O-N. There's two S's there, so it's not poison. It's Poisson, or I suppose if we were really trying to be French, it would be something like Poisson, right? That's probably how, a little closer to how it's pronounced in French, but we say Poisson, but don't say poison. Number of successes in two minutes. The two here, uh, in our textbook at least, we'd be labeled with the letter S. It's if if one minute is considered to be the standard measurement unit of time here, then we've got two minutes. The standard unit of time, one minute, is being multiplied by a parameter called S in our textbook. What's the probability mass function? Let's focus on the binomial distribution first. That's the easiest one. What's its probability mass function? PMF, little f of x. This is a discrete random variable. When the variable is discrete, little f of x, the probability mass function let me give it a, make it a subscript capital X as well. 
the probability mass function of capital X PMF is the probability that the random variable capital X equals any given value little x. And remember, technically, we think of just defining this for all value, real values of x, but zero at practically all values of x, except for either a finite number or a countably infinite number of values of little x. With a binomial, it's zero except for n plus one values of x. And the formula is n choose x. Our book writes it like that. Other books will write it like that. Times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x for x equal to 0, 1, 2 through n, those n plus 1 whole numbers, those n plus 1 integers. 1 minus p, as we did with the geometric random variables, is often called q. So we can also write this as n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x. Is this even a valid probability mass function? In order to be a better add up to one, right? The, the sum over all values of x of the values of the PMF better equal one. In this case, all x means x goes from zero to n in increments of one. Does that really equal one? It doesn't look like it equals one. That's well, because you're not thinking about it in the right way. You're just like, I don't know. You need a theorem. This theorem is obvious to a, a small percentage of you, perhaps 10% of you maybe know what to do here, uh, but not so obvious to the other 90% of you. It's something from discrete math. Uh, it's related to the name of the random variable, binomial. Binomial theorem. Obviously, right? Huh? Binomial theorem. Pascal's triangle, expanding binomials to powers. Yes, no. This is the same as P plus Q to the N power. There's a binomial, P plus Q. It's the sum of two terms being raised to a power. These the, you've got a sum of powers of P and Q here with coefficients determined by combinations that come from Pascal's triangle. These N choose X's are the, you know, they're the numbers in Pascal's triangle. I'm assuming you've seen Pascal's triangle before. This row corresponds to N equals five, for example. Those are the coefficients. Those are the values of n choose x. When x is 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Just more abstract here. That's the binomial theorem. But wait a minute, q is 1 minus p. This is p plus 1 minus p to the n. Ah, oh, the p's cancel, giving us 1 to the n, which is always 1, no matter what n is. No matter what p is. Doesn't matter. This is a valid probability mass function. What's the mean? Thinking about it intuitively. My probability of making the free throw is 0.4. I'm trying at n times. Probably I'm going to get close to four successes. 10 times 0.4. If I tried 100 times, Probably close to 40, 100 times 0.4, n times, n times p, no matter what. Seems like the mean would be n times p. What do you need to do to find the mean? Well, one way is to 
add up X times the PMF values, right? Put an extra X in there and then do the sum. But if there's an extra factor of X, how do you use the binomial theorem? Doesn't sound easy. Maybe possible, but not easy. If there's an extra factor of X in there, first X is zero, then one, then two, then three. To tell you the truth, it's not clear to me what to do to ver the, verify the answer is n times p if you try that approach. But the moment generating function approach actually is easier. Turns out not too bad. What's the moment generating function approach? Well, we got to find the moment generating function first. Mx of t. By definition, it's the expected value of e to the tx. Which seems like it's going to be worse, doesn't it? I mean, this is going to be a sum over all x of e to the t times little x times the PMF values. Wouldn't that be worse? Instead of multiplying by x, I'm multiplying by e to the tx. That seems worse. And again, that's a Q. Isn't that worse? Uh, no, it's actually not worse. Because of the fact that the X is in the power there. This is the same as N, the sum of N choose X times P E to the T to the X power times, I'll, I'll change the one minus P to a Q. Because of the X being in the power in both of these spots here, this product can be written this way. Properties of exponents. And then I can use the binomial theorem again. Whereas if the X wasn't in the power, if it was just a plain X here being multiplied, I would not be able to use the binomial theorem right away at least. Without some sort of other weird trick that I can't predict. This is the same as this plus this to the n power, which I'll write as q plus p e to the t to the n power. There is the moment generating function right there. So its derivative evaluated at zero is supposed to be the first moment. Let's find the derivative first. Take the derivative of this. There's one, two, three, four, Five letters and four of them are variables. You know, E is not a variable. P, Q, T, and N are variables, so to speak. Well, not really. P and Q and N are all parameters. T is the only variable. We're differentiating with respect to T. We need the chain rule. We bring the N down. Oops. Ah. N times Q plus P E to the T to the n minus one, don't forget the chain rule, multiply times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of q is zero, the derivative of p e to the t is p e to the t. The expected value of x is found now by evaluating this derivative at zero. Like this. E to the zero is one, that's a one, that's a one. This becomes N times Q plus P times P, but Q plus P is one. This is N times P. Q plus P is one because Q is one minus P. Done, there's the mean. Just like as was predicted. Good to think about graphing this mean as a function of p, I think sometimes. Here it's real simple. It's a straight line. As your probability goes from zero to one, the expected value goes from zero to n. Now, in any given situation, the probability is not a variable. It's a, it's a constant, like 0.4 for my free throw shooting. But it is helpful to think, I think, about this graph to say, well, as the probability changes, how does the expected value change? If your probability of making the free throw is 100%, you are going to make n free throws in n attempts. 
and it goes up linearly. What about the variance? Well, we want to find the second moment first and then use the computational formula for the variance. And they're not equal, right? Second moment does not equal the variance, but let's find the second moment first. I need to find the second derivative of the moment generating function. This moment generating function approach is better than other approaches here. It's, it's, you might say it's not pleasant, but it's easier than trying to do summations. Uh, di differentiate this, I'll need the product rule in addition to the chain rule. I got the product of two things there. The derivative of the first, I'm gonna bring down a n minus one, and the power will be n minus two times the second, plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Oh, I, for, I forgot, I made a mistake here. I, I forgot to multiply by, okay, I need to multiply by PE to the T twice because one of those factors comes from the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, and the second factor comes from the second factor up here. So I almost made a mistake there plus the first function times the derivative of the second, the derivative of p to the t is itself. So that is the second derivative unsimplified. The second moment now, expected value of x squared is gonna be that second derivative evaluated at zero, n times n minus one times q plus p, and that's going to be a big one, right? Because e to the zero is one times p to the zero times another p e to the zero. I'm using e to the zero equals one in all of this. Plus, I'm on the second line now, an n times q plus p, which again is one. That's a one times p e to the zero. This one goes up here. So it looks like we get n times n minus one times p squared plus n times p, if I have not made a mistake. That simplifies if I expand it out to um, n squared p squared minus n p squared plus n p. So now the variance expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x. Quantity squared should be n squared p squared minus n p squared plus n p minus n p quantity squared because n p is the expected value of x. This is gonna cancel with this. With what's left, we can factor out an n p and get something fairly simple, NPQ. There's the variance. And you can graph that as a function of P as well. P going from zero to one. What's the variance as a function of P? Think about it this way. Its graph's gonna be an upside down parabola. The variance if n is fixed, is maximized in the middle here when the probability of success is 0.5. If your probability of making a free throw is 0.5, you have the most variability in how many free throws you make. If it's something different than 0.5, like 0.4, it's a smaller variance and also smaller standard deviation. If you have a probability of making it very small or very large, then your variance is very small. If your probability of making the free throw is 0.1, you're a terrible, terrible free throw shooter. On 10 attempts, you typically make one, but sometimes you make zero, sometimes you might make two if you're lucky. Rarely would you make three or more. There's not much variability in how many you make. Whereas if your probability of success is close to 0.5, it's a reasonably high probability that you might make just two out of 10, or maybe on the other side, eight out of 10. There's more variability in how many you make in 10 attempts. Again, in any given situation, your probability P would be constant. So the moral of the story here is we can do all this um, and use the moment generating functions to find means and so forth. One thing I didn't explain 
is where does this formula come from in the first place? And that comes from independence in the multiplication rule as a, in addition to the addition rule for mutually exclusive events, which was axiom three of probability. Independent, what we have here for the binomial distribution is we have the number of successes in N trials where the trials are assumed to be either success or failure, they're Bernoulli trials, they're independent and identical trials. Your probability of success effectively stays constant and is not affected by what happened before. If you keep making a missing a bunch in a row, you're not demoralized and your probability of success doesn't go down. It's a simplifying assumption that may not match reality because people are affected by being demoralized, right? It's a simplifying assumption for the purpose of modeling. Yeah, I'm not really explaining where this formula comes from in the first place. It is in the book described through examples. I'm also not going to fully explain where the next formula comes from. Still need to talk about technology here. Okay. How is the binomial distribution calculated with technology? With the calculator, TI graphing calculator, at least you go to the distribution menu, which is above the variables button. Second VARS gives me my distribution menu. And I need to scroll down until I, until I see binome PDF. Really for us, that would be binome PMF. Keep it simple, they just call it a PDF because then they can call it a PDF for continuous distributions as well, just like our textbook does. Use that. Number of trials, 10, probability of success, 0.4. X value is I'm, the number I'm interested in finding the probability of, the number of successes. I've got a two in there. What's my probability of having exactly two successes? Can I guess? Uh, I'm going to guess, I don't know, 0.1 <laughs> ballpark. 0.12. So if I attempt 10 free throws, I got about a 12% chance of making two of them. I'm most likely to make four of them, but that does not mean my probability of making four of them is bigger than 50%. It's just that the probability mass function is maximized at four, I'm gonna guess 0.2 something, maybe 0.3, 0.25. Doesn't mean I'm gonna get bigger than 0.5. It's just maximize there. Other numbers of successes will be smaller than that. My probability of having three successes, change this to a three, will be smaller than 0 0.25, 0 0.21. My probability of Five successes should be smaller than 0.25 as well. Would it be bigger than 0.21? I'm not sure. Smaller, 0 0.20. Not the same. It's not a symmetric distribution when P is not 0.5. Not the same as that probability right there. How about with a spreadsheet? This works both in Google Sheets and Excel. Equals binome dist will do it for you. Number of successes, oh, say four. Number of trials, 10, probability success, 0.4. Is it cumulative or not? Is it a PDF or PMF or a CDF? If I put a false or a zero in place of a false, it'll be a PMF. This will be the 0.25. You can see it already. If I put a one, or true, it'll be a CDF value, the probability of getting less than or equal to four successes, which is fairly large, 0.633. The CDFs on the calculator as well. And you really do need the some sort of built-in function or a table for CDF values here because there's no closed formula for the CDF. Okay. 
factor of 0.633. How about Mathematica? Ignore that. Mathematica has got a built-in command binomial distribution. How about that? Although if you want a PMF values, you first type actually PDF, capital letters, then binomial distribution. I believe N comes first, then P, and then after that square bracket, put a comma and then the number of successes you're after. There's a PDF value, the 0.25. If I copy and paste this and change the P to a C, I'll get the 0.633. Table in the back of the book for CDF values as well. We've got 12 minutes to do negative binomial and Poisson. Ha ha ha. Okay. So this is real quick. We will talk about it more on Thursday. Negative binomial distribution. You're still doing independent and identical Bernoulli trials with probability P of success, just like with binomial, just the, like with my free throw shooting. Trials are observed until exactly our successes are obtained, where R is the fixed by the experimenter. For me, with my random variable Y, I was after the number of trials until uh, 10 successes. I was guessing it'd be 25 trials. So R, the number of successes after was 10. 10 free throws made. Probably I'll have to have around 25 attempts to do that. X does not count the number of successes, it counts the number of trials. And yes, you can go through probability arguments and talk about independence to come up with this PMF formula right here. Yeah. X minus one, choose R minus one. Oh, well, I guess it's not that bad. Times Q to the X minus R times P to the R. Where careful here, X is doesn't start at zero, doesn't start at one. It starts at R, R, R plus one, R plus two, et cetera. It could be arbitrarily large. I could keep trying until I have success, 10 successes. I could be going a little, really long time. You know, if my probability of success was really low, 0 0.01, I could be making hundreds, maybe even thousands of attempts before I make it 10 times. R, is the number of successes we're after, 10 in this case, X is the number of trials. That's the formula you'd use. Unfortunately, my TI at least doesn't have negative binomial distribution in it. So we need to either rely on a spreadsheet or Mathematica spreadsheet, negative, Neg, there it is, neg binome, not gynome, binome dist. Number, of, okay, huh, hmm. The spreadsheet is doing it differently than the book does. Notice that first input is not the number of trials, it's the number of failures. It's doing it for Z. It's not what doing what our textbook the way our textbook is thinking of it. Y was the number of trials until I have 10 successes. Z was the number of failures until I have 10 successes. In both cases, those are R values. Okay, I'm after 10 successes. I'm wondering, What's the probability that it takes me 25 attempts to get 10 successes? That would be equivalent to 15 failures, right? If, if, if you're doing a homework problem and the question is saying, what's the probability that it takes you 25 trials until you have 10 successes and you're using the spreadsheet to compute it, that's the same as 15 failures before 10 successes. So I need a 15. 
10 successes, 0.4 probability of success. 0 0.064. That's where that should be maximized. If I do some other number of failures besides 15, like 14 and 10 successes, 0.4 probability of success, it should be a smaller probability. Well, it's not. Ah. Okay. I was I was misled by what the mean is. The mean is still 15 failures, but I guess because it's not a symmetric distribution, the mean is not where it's maximized. That was a bad mistake on my part. They're close. Certainly if you go far away from 4, 15 here, they're going to start to get smaller. The 10 failures, 10 successes, 0.4. That'll be a smaller number. Yeah. Or if I go the other way, say 20 failures, 10 successes, so 30 attempts, that'll be a small, smaller probability as well. If you want CDF values, you need to add things up in the spreadsheet. You can do that very quickly by making a table of values. Again, we're after number of trials until 10 successes. So the smallest value of X is 10. That's the R. So I'm after CDF values, capital F of X. Well, with 10, it would be the same as a PMF value. D2 is where the 10 is, 10 successes, 0.4 probability of success. If I now add up the previous value and the next value of neg binome dist, this will be a CDF value. Now I'm adding values of little f of x because, I, I, because you see the sum in them. And these numbers are just going to keep going up and up. And in the end, if you keep going here, they should approach one because they are CDF values. So there's no built-in command to get this evidently in a spreadsheet. See those numbers on the right, right? Are getting oh, very slowly. Okay, it's going to be an infinite sum in the end that gets close to one. So it's very slow, but I, I trust it would go to one. With Mathematica, PDF, negative binomial distribution. There it is. Capital N, capital B, capital D. I better look up the syntax. Mathematica is calling the parameters N and P. If you want more detail on that, P is the probability of, what does it say? P is the probability of success before N successes occur. N is acting like, like the R. <laughs> now we're talking about successes instead of failures though, so it's tricky. Uh, so evidently I need a NP, 10 successes, 0.4 probability of failure, and I'm wondering what's the probability. Oh, no, it is the number of failures right there. Number of failures. Did I get 15 failures? Yeah, that's the same as we got with the spreadsheet. So the syntax here, this is the number of successes that I'm after. That's the R in the book. There's your probability of success, 0.4 P. There's the number of failures if you want, if you're after the number of trials until you get, if you're after the probability of 25 trials before 10 successes, you have 15 failures. 